Welcome, my friends, to The Eyes of Mara, a new miniseries from Those Happy Places, all about Indiana Jones and the Temple of the Forbidden Eye. I'm Buddy Duquesne. And I'm Alice White. And Alice, guess what? <laughs> what, Buddy? Last week on this very miniseries, we covered the history and development of this classic attraction, Open 1995, and that brings us on the timeline to 1995. We are ready to talk about the ride as it was on opening day, the story that it was telling, the ways it was telling it, the innovations that were present both in the queue and on the ride itself. It is going to be one heck of an episode. I hope you're ready. I'm so excited. I love this ride. I remember when it opened, I was pretty young, but I remember when it opened, I remember the ride in its, in its heyday. Um, I am really excited to talk about it because as it still remains one of my favorite rides to this day, there is a pretty big difference about Indiana Jones and the Temple of the Forbidden Eye and what we now know as Indiana Jones Adventure, which is essentially the same ride, but with some pretty significant um, like updates and changes that have, that have been made. And a lot of the ride as it existed in 1995 um, has kind of almost not faded to the background, um, but a lot of this, the stuff that was like available to writers in 95 is like a little bit lost in, um, in how we experience the ride today. So I'm really excited to talk about it with you. Uh, we've done some research for this one and uh, buddy, you actually got to ride the ride this weekend. You were yeah. in Disneyland this weekend. Yeah, I, I was. I was at Disneyland uh, just a few days before the recording of this episode and was doing a little field research on the state of the ride, you know, right here, right now in uh, October of 2022. Uh, so that's good. But uh, first, I'd like to take us back in time to to the uh, glory days of this attraction. And the reason we called this episode, episode two, uh, Glittering Gold, It Is Yours, uh, because this is the only ride that I can really think of at Disneyland, especially where people talk about it in the past tense as well as in the present tense. Like, oh, it was so cool. It is still good, but it was still cool. There's this like idea that at opening, this ride was doing things that seemed impossible and that indeed turned out to be unsustainable. Um, this idea that the ride that we have now, despite massive changes and in many ways improvements, uh, is somehow inferior to the old experience. And that's what I'm interested in exploring today is like, what was that golden era? Uh, what's going on with the ride uh, at opening that people are are still nostalgic for or still pine for even if they never got to experience it in that very very brief period where everything worked <laughs> um, and that's that's so interesting right because this riot runs every single day with an hour plus long line and is still clearly a people eater and hugely popular and yet what was it back then? Like, oh, what a ride it was, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. And I am super excited to discuss that with you. Uh, but first, I think we got um, some stuff to cover about the ride uh, itself. This is a... Um, we're going to do just real quick. We're going to tell everybody the story of Indiana Jones and the Temple of the Forbidden Eye. Like, literally the story what happens on the ride what and what are we seeing what are we experiencing what are we doing um on this ride to kind of set the scene if you were in disneyland in 1995 and you walked through the queue and into the temple still in the queue but where the story starts as part of the pre-show we're gonna walk through the ride and tell you what you would have seen on that day yeah, and, and we gotta we gotta start here because this is a narratively focused experience that, despite the fact that it is quite thrilling and that lends itself to to a lot of the, the popularity here, it is telling one of the most detailed stories of any attraction at the Disneyland Resort. Absolutely. There's so much going on here. There's there so are, much going on. It could be like its own screenplay for yeah. an Indiana Jones movie. <laughs> there are rules established and characters established that even though they might not appear on the ride, their presence is felt. Like um, Indy's friend and partner in a lot of the films, um, Marcus Brody, 
is there actually like he's, sure. he's in there um so you know, is we, abner ravenwood like so is abner ravenwood who is who is indy's kind of mentor right like there's a lot going on here where we're like uh oh these guys are here like sala's here too and he's running these tours um kind of on the side uh, let's let's jump right into it because there's there's so much to cover so absolutely uh, to set the scene we're in uh india specifically in a fictional part of india known as the Lost Delta, and the year is 1935. Yes. So when you enter the queue, you see a series of, uh, there's a, a big truck carrying a load of boxes. There's, um, you know, things scattered throughout the like very beginning of the queue where you're looking, you're like, this is an expedition, 1935. There are people have t- are taking boxes in and out of this space. And there is a temple in front where you can walk through the door into the temple. And a uh, fun fact, that truck that's sitting outside loaded with stuff is one of the actual vehicles used in the filming of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a, what we might call a picture car, right? Yes. Um, and it's got a bunch of stuff and it's all boxes and crates labeled, um, you know, to, to take away, to take out of the temple. And so you, you enter the temple... Um, because you're about to go on a tour of the temple. That's yeah. that you. That's where that's where we start. Yeah, uh, there's some other stuff out front of the temple. Uh, there's a generator that is constantly running. Uh, the generator can uh, sputter and kind of uh, die for a minute before it starts running again, and that actually correlates with uh, flickering lights and a loss of uh, radio audio uh, in the queue, which is pretty cool. So it's like all all interconnected as if the generator is actually running. Yeah. Um, on my most recent visit, I noticed a lot of uh, books and scraps and notes and canned goods. Uh, mm-hmm. Just like things that kind of show that this is a living uh, archaeological dig. And of yes. course, in front of the temple, there are these famous or maybe infamous uh, snake statues, uh, including these these amazing pillars that have this kind of stylized snake that I, I think of as um, really synonymous with the ride. The the snake is kind of cartoony in, in an interesting way, uh, but also like very threatening looking. Uh, yeah. the, snakes, the snake's on everything. Uh, there's two big snakes uh, going up the steps into the temple. There's snakes on these pillars. There's snakes on uh, these like kind of fresco carvings that we see everywhere. Uh, so the snakes are a, a big piece of foreshadowing. Like, this is going to be a snake place, too. There's snakes here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So as you go through the queue, um, you learn um, uh, the background information on how they found this temple and, like, what is going on inside of it. There are 12 letters and telegrams that are scattered throughout the queue, as well as newsreels that are shown before you board the attraction. Uh, now, these newsreels are no longer currently running. But again, we're talking about how you would have experienced the ride in 1995 um, and up until just a couple of years ago when these newsreels were running. Um, but if you are spending time in the queue, you can stop and read. There's like a walled off office um, kind of set up where there's a bunch of papers scattered. And if you're standing in the queue, you can look through the through the grate and read some of these letters. And this is where you're going to get a lot of this information about like, what is Indiana Jones? What are Indiana Jones and Abner Ravenwood and Marcus Brody and Sala? Like, what are they up to here in this space? Um, you find out that the ancient tem- temple uh, was believed to have been buried in a flood over 2000 years ago. And the temple is built to honor the deity Mara, who offers one of three gifts to all who come to the hallowed site, either eternal youth, earthly riches, or visions of the future. On the condition that you never gaze into the eyes of Mara. Don't look into the eyes of Mara. And that is why the temple is, has been dubbed the Temple of the Forbidden Eye by the media. And we should never gaze into the eyes of the idol. That could be dangerous. Uh, yes. <laughs> and and it, it it's interesting, right? Like there's uh, these three gifts. It's all part of the legend. And what we find out when we ride the ride is that it's like true. Um, like as long as you follow the rules, uh, you will emerge with these gifts. And the newsreels used to show people emerging from the temple having become younger. Uh, or clutching with... armfuls of golden treasure. Yeah. 
um, which is just like so cool. It's like, wow, like there there is magic here. Like there's something going on. And that's why people, including us, presumably, are flocking to it. And it's part mm-hmm. of what Indiana Jones is doing here is like trying to figure out what exactly is happening. Right. Um, because as we know from our experience watching the Indiana Jones films, magic is real. Uh, <laughs> and it, it simply functions in all sorts of different ways depending on like the origin of the magic so you know not only is there a guy who can reach through your chest and pull out your heart or an arc that if you open it and are evil it melts your face um (laughs) but there's also this temple where you can go and the literal fountain of youth is inside yes Um, right and so they've discovered it and it works and is real and um the media like gets a hold of it and sends cameras and that's why we have newsreels of like the things that are happening at this temple and uh however their funding has run out um (laughs) so sala begins conducting guided tours to raise money so the excavation can continue so they've unearthed like the first part of the temple where sala is now going to walk you through and give you a guided tour or like put you in a jeep and give you a guided tour of the um of the like first part of the temple so long as you don't look into the eye of mara (laughs) yeah because Um, people aren't coming back from this tour that that sala is guiding yes lots of people die (laughs) people are dying uh which which adds to the the sense of danger of course but also like it demonstrates that there are some stakes here and there's a lot in the in the queue that also demonstrate the the stakes right there um for example is an entire room of uh, a spike trap that has already been kind of deactivated um but that uh, guests used to be able to activate by pushing on a bending pole and if you pushed on this pole the, the spike trap would reactivate and, and threaten and- to crush the guests inside with horrible spikes from above <laughs> from the yeah the ceiling would lower and spikes would appear and like that that was something that you as a as a writer in 1995 and for many many years after could experience you could rotate this like fake bamboo bamboo pole and like the spikes would fall from the ceiling and like a horrible noise would happen and it was really loud (laughs) it was super loud and um the other the other thing was um that there are these diamonds on the ground and so because they've made um they've made the place safe for tourists because they're leading (laughs) The uh, diamonds on the ground are all activated and there are like bamboo poles holding up the pillar of stone that would have fallen on you. So you can stand on the diamond and look up and a block from the ceiling has been dislodged and looks like it's about to fall on you. But there's a pole holding it up. It's pretty cool. There's like stuff just like wedged in there. You can tell that it was a rush job. Like they were just like, (laughs) I just just get it, get it stuck so that nobody dies. Um, And there's a there's a part where a, a big round stone has been rolled away. I think this is right after the the spike pit. Uh, And it's jammed up against the wall with like a pickaxe. Like you can tell that the archaeologists are kind of using whatever's on hand to kind of like get around these deadly traps. (laughs) To make the place safe enough for the tourists that are coming in. And that's you. Why did Um, it have to be tourists? (laughs) Why did it have to be tourists? Um, And so, yeah, you walk through and you can see like skulls on spikes. You can see like the remnants of like other people that were not so lucky <laughs> having gone <laughs> gone through this um this trap this like horrible trap and you enter this great big room where there's a, where it is still clearly an active archaeological dig happening so there's um um scaffolding on the walls and there's archaeological like tools brushes pickaxes etc kind of scattered throughout the room um, they are uncovering this this big chamber, and then there's like a hole in the ground uh, that looks like a well with a rope that hangs down into it. And if you pull on the rope, you can hear the sounds of uh, clattering, um, you know, tools and people shouting and yelling and, and falling down and stuff because you've pulled on their equipment. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're obviously excavating something in the basement, uh, yeah. and you can mess with them a little bit by pulling on this rope. There's the the idea that you personally are going to disrupt the archaeology because you're just walking through and disobey a sign that says do not pull on rope um, (laughs) is so funny to me. It's so slapstick. I mean, Indiana Jones is about physical comedy as well as as a franchise. Oh, Um, yeah. And so to have that moment where you're like, I'm going to pull on this and you hear somebody below be like, no. (laughs) No. 
<laughs> uh, it's just so good. Like it's so good, and, and it, it's immersive, and you become part of the story of Indiana Jones. And yeah. um, so as you as you continue, and and as there's more more documents and stuff for you to read, you also learn, uh, and also in the newsreel um, that Sala tells you a story, um, you find out that Indiana Jones um, is missing. Uh, Indiana Jones himself, the man himself, is inside the temple. He went to go find some missing tourists, and he's looking for the temple's power source, which is known as the Jewel of Power. Um, and they think it's somewhere inside some immense cavern beyond the Gates of Doom. But Indiana Jones has been gone for a whole week, and nothing, uh, like, there's no sign of the guy. Um, and so, um, according to you know what you find and what you learn Marcus Brody has requested that Sala continues conducting the tours in the hopes that during one of those tours they're going to find Indiana Jones yeah so you know part of our part of our job here is to kind of run into Indy right um it's not as I, I actually love this solution for for involving the audience it's not as um clumsy and random as hey you guys can help us it's a more elegant solution for a more civilized age. Yeah, so we're going to take a tour of this place, <laughs> and if we happen to find Indiana Jones, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> wouldn't that be cool? Like, Sala, Sala would love to run into Indy, and so if we do, you know, that's that's all the better. Um, and we do not rescue Indiana Jones. No, he um, rescues us. <laughs> yeah, because we're, we're a bunch of dumb tourists who thought, you know, a dangerous temple and an evil idol were a great way to, you know, fulfill our desires, I guess. Like, oh yeah, yeah I need some extra cash. Let me just delve into the, the deadly chamber of Mara. Like, <laughs> um, money, by the way, Alice, uh, there, there are three things that we can receive, right? You know, uh, the treasure of Mara, glittering gold that is yours, uh, the fountain of eternal youth, you have chosen wisely, the path leads to timeless youth and beauty. And of course, uh, the observatory of the future. Mara says, you seek the future. I will lift the curtain of time. It is your destiny. Oh, wait, the spirit of Mara moved through me again. Um, <laughs> Alice, how low tier is gold on that on that <laughs> list of, of things you can get? Oh, totally. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I, I, I made a couple hundred bucks in gold by delving into the, the treasure of Mara. Yeah, like, but okay. my friend over there received a vision of the future, and now he's going to make a bunch of money in the stock market. And like, my <laughs> other friend is young forever. Congratulations. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I like, know. Fountains of youth in the Indiana Jones mythos also cure wounds and diseases. Um, so, like, yeah, maybe you should get on that. Eternal youth seems to be the seems for me. Eternal youth would be the one. Which one would you choose if you had a choice? Uh, if everybody can see the future, nobody can. Uh huh. Uh, and so you know, the curtain of time is always shifting. I feel like it's a it's a trick. I think the fountain of youth is probably your best bet, though. Uh, there's a line of dialogue at the end of the ride. One of the available lines from Sala is, "If you drank too much from the fountain of youth, we'd be happy to assist you with a stroller." <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh wait, so like this is also a trap, right? Like, no, no way am I going backwards. I just want like." timeless health you know yeah uh and so i worry about that uh i think about this a lot because i am on a theme park podcast uh <laughs> oh what's and, it called uh those happy places maybe <laughs> oh, oh okay uh and i think you know no matter what you pick you're kind of getting a a, a not so great deal but probably probably fountain of youth that that feels less uh, less like it's going to end up blowing up in your face. Uh, yeah. Future vision is so, so dangerous in general yeah. in fiction. I wonder, though, if earthly riches wouldn't be the practical choice um, because, like, with a lot of earthly riches, maybe you could get yourself some, like, life-saving surgeries and stuff <laughs> to, like, increase the, you know, like... How how your life is, you know, sure, increase but, the but value Mara's of your life. But influence is is supernatural, right? So like, no, no matter what you're gonna get, especially in 1935, like no matter what you're gonna get, like the Fountain of Youth stuff is gonna be way better. That's true. Uh, so I feel like that's you know, if if there is a cure all out there and it is in a deadly temple, I could see that being enough uh, motivation for a lot of folks to just go for it. Yeah, and but speaking of of Mara's. Um, influence and his uh, super or Mara's supernatural uh, influence. Um, uh, let's talk about Mara's existence in this temple, like especially in the queue. Yeah. I want to talk, talk about Mara, but specifically I want to talk about Mara glyphics. 
Yeah, Mara is is presented in this queue as extremely benevolent, um, which you know kind of betrays that the the cult of Mara or whoever was worshiping Mara, um, like really saw Mara as a, a positive figure that also should not be trifled with, right? Right. So like a lot of Mara's depictions within the queue are, uh, you know, Mara's like dancing and has like the fountain and, and the gold. And you're like, oh, like Mara seems like a pretty chill dude. Um, you know, Mara is, it appears as a big face, but the face is smiling and, and happy. Uh, even as Mara is surrounded by snakes and deadly traps. Right. Um, Mara the, I, gets more sinister the farther you go in. <laughs> Definitely. Mara, Mara is absolutely not one to be trifled with. Don't mess with Mara. Don't look in the eye of Mara. But if you follow all the rules, you will be rewarded. And that um, and and successfully rewarded. As we've seen the video in the newsreels, people being successfully uh, rewarded by following the rules of Mara. And we can learn even more about Mara, not just from the like visuals in the queue, but from the Mara glyphics that are present throughout the temple. And so on opening day, 1995, and for, for quite a while thereafter, but not so much anymore. Now, now, you, now there's an app for this, but there's you used to, uh, that it's part of the Play Disney app now, but you used to be able to, um, when you walked on to the ride, the cast member at the door of the temple would give you a decoder card to translate the messages that are hidden throughout the queue. So there, there is writing on the wall in a mysterious language called Maraglyphics and a messages that are left painted on the wall in this language. And you can use your decoder card to translate them. Um, and it, it, you, it used to be like a really good way to pass time in the queue. Like if you were waiting for over an hour and you had your little decoder card so you could like figure out what the stuff on the on the wall say. You still can do that. Although as it seems now you move a little faster through that part of the queue. Uh, so stopping to decode stuff wouldn't uh, would be a little bit wasteful, I think. Yeah. But but you still you still can do this if this is something you want to do. You can decode the messages on the wall, and um, and I, I'm gonna read you some of the messages um, that are on there. There's a lot. There's a lot of maraglyphics scattered around. They're pretty much everywhere. There any time that you might find yourself stopped and near a wall, um, there there are things you can read that will uh, clue you in a little bit about the beliefs of the cult of Mara and what lies ahead for you in the Chamber of Destiny. Right. So some of these messages say things like, Mara shall guide you through the doorway of your most secret desire in the Chamber of Destiny. Or, one look will lead through the tunnel of torment to the gates of doom. True rewards await those who choose wisely. Only the blind shall see. Only one spring can restore youth and vigor. Choose wisely. Drink deeply the water of life. So these these are just just some of the messages that are that are scattered around. And again, th th this is giving us like a very positive portrayal of Mara. Yes, there is the threat of tunnel of torments and gates of doom, <laughs> but that's only if you look. One look will lead through the tunnel of torment to the gates of doom. The rest is really positive. You yeah. if you choose wisely, there are rewards for you. Your most secret desire in the chamber of destiny will be given to you. Yeah. You can drink deeply from the water of life. Those are those are like really good things <laughs> yeah. being given. Uh these these decoder cards for me are pretty legendary. I know there is an app for that now. Um actually Alice I I downloaded the Play Disney Parks app. Uh, and uh, checked it out, and it's not it's not quite as cool as a decoder card. It's funny how the the physical object for me would have been so much cooler. So I actually just googled the decoder card and was using that in the line. Um, <laughs> it, there's there's images of it all over Google yeah. search. So like, it's really really cool that this was like a planned thing. Like this was going to be a popular attraction. Guests are going to need something to do. Who doesn't love a good decoder ring? Uh, and so that's what they did. Uh, now, Maraglyphics is not complicated. It's no. a It's an A to Z cipher where, you know, the, the Maraglyphics actually just kind of resemble the letters that they're they supposed do. to represent. They do, except for the I, which is definitely just in the shape of an eyeball. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. I mean, like, we can't resist a good pun. Uh, but, you know, the... The messages aren't anything too special. Um, you're not getting, like, secret insight into the story. 
It's just like, this is an ongoing archeological dig of a strange and mysterious culture. And we have figured out how to read their writing. And now you too get to be part of that. Yeah. Um, and that's very, very cool. And even involving, right? You like get to feel like an archeologist a little bit. Uh, and it encourages attention to detail, which I think kind of feeds into the rest of what's going on with the queue. I mean, this thing is immaculate uh, in terms of what it's presenting. I mean, you walk through a cave full of bats and <laughs> the the cave is full of bat poop, Alice. Like, <laughs> like how, who, who was like, oh wait, this has gotta be covered in poop and everybody else was like, yes, yes, I agree. It's gotta be covered in I agree, in it's poop. absolutely <laughs> completely covered in, in fake guano. It's yeah. everywhere. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, and like, you know, not the most pleasant experience, but also this is the world that we're in, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we're delving into this old, deserted, bat-infested, spooky cavern. So, like, it's it's got to have that stuff. And so, like, when you are on the lookout for every shred of maroglyphics or every telegram from Marcus Brody or whatever we're looking for, like, you are noticing that there are details everywhere and this queue is in so many... So many spaces, 360 degrees, fully immersive and just fully like surrounding you with the world of Indiana Jones that having an activity that also involves you in that, that that's so physical and present in the space is also really, really good. Like, sure, there's an app for that, but no app is going to do that. You know, like the app actually interacts with the physical world in a really effective way way better than like the the bluetooth connected game for for space mountain or whatever that the play disney parks app has mm -hmm. um a, a cue that is that level of alive that level of detail and that level of interactive and also you can disregard this uh it's not crucial to your enjoyment it's just like a deepening of your yeah. enjoyment yeah Absolutely. And it, and it, I remember playing with the decoder. I remember getting a card and now I really wish I had kept it. I think we just threw our decoder cards away because we thought they would be around forever. Um, but I should have kept, kept it since they're no longer a thing. Yeah, you just um, get it on your next trip, right? <laughs> right, of course. Um, but I remember playing with it and standing there and trying to translate and, and reading the alphabet and thinking like, like, ooh, what's this one going to say? Oh, what, oh, what is he right over here? You know, what, what am I going to learn? And, and being creeped out a little bit as a, as a little kid, thinking like, like these messages are, are threatening or these message are, are, messages are dangerous and they're, you know, scrawled warnings on the wall to not look into the eye and, and how, like, how scarier it made the experience, thinking like somebody came in here and painted those um you know, to, to warn us away. And yet here we go trudging forward in the line. Um, and, and, and things like that and things like, um, on the obelisk in the, um, in the very first room of the temple where the four sides of the obelisks show four of the dangers that you will experience while on the ride. Because you you know you expect you oh we're gonna go on this tour and we're nothing dangerous is gonna happen we're not gonna look into the eye and we're gonna walk away with eternal riches sure sure but but you are being there there are hints in throughout that this place is not as like safe as you want it to be between all the scaffolding and things falling and and traps that have been activated and like the obelisk at the beginning which that has the four sides that show um, the death by snakes by fire, by rats, and by spikes. Those are like danger dangers and perils that are that have been found within the temple. Yeah. Um and and so it's it stands as a warning, like be careful. And as a little kid in 1995, 1996, extremely effective. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I was scared of the queue itself for a long time. Just the queue. And yep. I think the queue serves as a um, kind of a first hurdle. If you aren't ready for the queue, maybe you're not ready for the ride. I even certainly, if you meet the, the height requirement. I certainly wasn't. I actually did. I, I do have a very vivid memory of probably the year 1995 or 1996 um, going with a friend and her family to Disneyland. And my friend's mom had to take me out of the queue because I was terrified i was so scared i couldn't do it and she sat with me until my friend and her dad had come out of the of the ride they wrote wow. it and i didn't yeah. and um so that was my very first indiana jones experience and then the next time i went 
Um, I was with my own mother who who uh, <laughs> in, <laughs> encouraged me to keep going. Yeah. Um, you know, and having her by my side helped <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> instead of like my friend's mom who I didn't know as well, you know. Yeah. Um, but then I had my mom by me and she was like, it's OK. Like, look, we can. Uh, we can pull this rope and isn't that funny and uh, oh look it's it's your indiana jones friend he's you know <laughs> he's um he, you know well we're gonna go save him you know and and yeah. helped and helped me through the ride and and fr- and then i had the time of my life and it's been one of my favorites ever since yeah but i was too scared of the queue for uh for a while <laughs> yeah uh and and that's that's a criticism that i often hear is that the the queue is long it is uh, pretty dark. It's uh, scary as heck. I mean, something I think is really narratively effective about the queue is that you are already overcoming the traps of the temple. And I think that's really cool. Like, we're already doing some of what we're going to be doing on the ride. Like, we're dodging traps already. Um, even though a lot of these have been sprung already and we're just kind of moving past them, uh, there's this feeling of like, oh, we're already kind of like doing the action archaeologist thing um and but i think i think uh according to our research that the queue itself the interior queue was half a mile in length um like it's Mm -hmm. a long walk it Uh, really is and when you when you get off the ride it's a long walk out as well i don't think it's half a mile um probably if it's if it's fully uh snaked and, and you're doing a lot of switchbacks um but the the way out is is quite long as well it really adds to this feeling that you're on a meaningful journey. Uh, something that we sometimes forget to mention is that uh, the show building is actually beyond the berm. Uh, and so a lot of the queue, and I, I paid extra attention to this uh, this time while I was I was uh, doing my field research, uh, a lot of the queue is underground and through the berm, uh, which is actually the same system that uh, the Haunted Mansion used to get a little bit more space uh, and to go past the berm. You know, the facade is within the berm, uh, and then you go through the queue in an enclosed area to go past the train tracks and then into the show building, um, which is just ingenious and so good. And also, you needed to go on a bit of a, a jaunt, a walk, to get there. Uh, and so I hear a lot from people like, this queue is just endless. How many more rooms? Uh, <laughs> but on the other hand... Isn't that what temple diving is? Like, this is this is quite realistic, or at least quite believable, even if it's not quite realistic. Um, it feels true to form. It feels true to Indiana Jones form. Yes. Like, whether or not this is actually how archaeological digs, like, look or looked <laughs> in 1935, seems actually to be almost irrelevant. Yeah. Um, we are walking into the world of Indiana Jones, where slapstick comedy and magic and Harrison Ford doing <laughs> doing crazy tricks with a whip are all like real things. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and and you get room after room after room to immerse you into this world. You're reminded that this is the world we're walking into. This is not the real world. Um, and I just, I love that. I love it so much. The queue is so, so impressive. Um, And it sets up this whole story that that we have now covered, I think, uh, very in depth. Um, And the the story, the story is, as we said, you're getting uh, on a tour to go save Indiana Jones. Don't look into the eye. Maybe we'll find Indiana Jones. Just kidding. You looked into the eye because of course you did. <laughs> of course you look into the eye. Yeah, 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 yeah. To step it back for a minute, we we uh, get on <laughs> to uh, this enhanced motion vehicle Jeep thing. Uh, and immediately it is clear that the Jeep is janky. Uh, oh, yeah. It's it's uh, uh, pitching and rolling forward. It, it's not uh, accelerating smoothly. It's got this kind of jerky motion. Mm-hmm. Sala comes in over the radio, tells us that the the brakes are bad, but good luck. Uh, <laughs> and then we uh, then we are presented with three doors. You are presented with three doors, which are as we covered, as we said, the Fountain of Eternal Youth, the Chamber of Earthly Riches, and the Observatory of the Future. And um, and uh, if you were riding this ride in 1995, you would approach one of the three doors to the left, to the middle or to the right. And you would 
to the to the left, I think, was um, uh, op- Observatory of the Future. Down the middle is Earthly Riches, and to the right is the Fountain of Eternal Youth, if I'm not mistaken. The middle was Earthly er- Riches. Earthly Riches, for sure. Yeah. I, uh, uh, I the, remember the that very two, vividly. The other two I can't quite remember. But the, the, the fact of the matter remains that this was a very cool and innovative effect that uh, no longer exists. This is actually a removed effect. Like, they just chose to take it out yes this no uh, longer you now only go down the center path um right. but the center path could be one of the three doors you don't yeah. know which door it's going to be before you make the turn um but it used to be that you could go down what what appeared to be one of three paths right and in reality it was one pathway with a uh shifting facade in front of it that made it look like you were going left center or right uh, which is really, really cool, and it's a shame that they took it out, but, you know, it never really worked. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a, a couple of shifting walls and, like, a cleverly placed mirror that made it look always like there were three doors to choose from. Um, and you did always go down uh, practically, what, what was practically the center door. But yes. the way that the wall would shift, it would look like maybe that, that there were two rooms to the side. Um, right. So it didn't look like the center door. Right. Um, and so you would go down down one of those paths and you go into one of the rooms and it is uh, elaborately decorated to show you what um, what treasure Mara is going to give you. Yeah. Is, is it the Fountain of Eternal Youth, which is kind of shaded blue and very um, like serene and peaceful. And there's murals on the wall of... Uh, of people dancing in the fountain old and coming out young and um, and the chamber of earthly riches where all the way down the hall is nothing but glittering gold and it It is is yours yours. (laughs) and all these big beautiful piles of gold or you're going down the observatory of the future and it's stars in the sky and the room is tinted purple and it's very mysterious. Ooh, you seek the future. I will lift the curtain of time. It is your destiny, Mara says. Yeah. Mara, by the way, I haven't mentioned this yet and I really want to make sure that we <laughs> that we recognize this. Mara is voiced by James Earl Jones. Originally, yes. Actually, that's <laughs> a, a bit of a fraught piece of its history. We'll get into the into the <laughs> later uses of the voice. But yeah, originally but I Mara set, was I want to set James the scene here. You're hearing the the voice of James Earl Jones himself telling you <laughs> about like all of these amazing things that you could have, but don't look in the eye. And then he says, you looked into my eye. Infidels, you looked into my eye. Your path now leads to the gates of doom. And, and then what's so cool. About and then he that laughs. laughs. <laughs> what's so cool about that moment is there, there is an exit uh, with some like uh, very stylized paintings of people like chilling out and partying with all their cool riches uh, off to the off to the right, and then suddenly, while he laughs maniacally, the jeep is swept to the left, and you're now going down the path of doom. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and yeah, and that path it feels like you're floating away towards the gates of doom. It kind of feels in 1995 like your um, jeep has been picked up and is being like carried tractor beam style towards the gates of doom. And then who's there waiting for you? It's Indiana Jones, it's our Indiana best friend. Indiana Jones. Action it's our... <laughs> archaeologist Indiana Jones. In, uh, an audio animatronic of Indiana Jones is pushing on the gates of doom, which are tr- attempting to open. It's two big, huge stone doors that are attempting to open and Indiana Jones is holding them back and in 1995 successfully closes them and then your Jeep, the the effect of the Jeep kind of feels like you're being slammed to the ground. Like you like are no the, longer floating, you hit the ground because yeah, the, the gate power, has been closed. The power that was picking you up is like cut off when Indy manages to close the gates of doom. Like now you've got a chance. Um, and he says up to the left. <laughs> it's the only way it's out. It's the only way out. Uh, Or, like, be careful, there's big steps up there. (laughs) The Jeep, like, (laughs) climbs the steps. Um, It's so good. That moment, the the gates, the the swirling colors behind it, it feels eldritch, right? Like, something beyond our understanding is past these gates. And Indiana Jones is just like, nope, mm -mm, nope, 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 not today. Not today, George. Not dealing with that today. (laughs) You guys got to go left. (laughs) Left is the way out. So, so uh, you swerve to the left and climb up a hill, up the big steps, thump, 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 in a Jeep. It's all in a Jeep. This whole, you know, you're in this enhanced ride vehicle with those really cool tires, and you feel the steps as you climb up them. Um, and then all of a sudden you are facing 
Mara. <laughs> There's the the um, the statue of Mara is which is in in actuality um, forty foot tall, decaying like skull of Mara. It's this like statue where half of it's been melted away, and it's shooting green laser beams at you. And uh, and there it is, and that's that John Williams score kicks in, and you're suddenly you're like, oh, this is we did we did a bad job. It's <laughs> we are. Oh, this is Indiana Jones now, though. Like it's it's on. Like we are <laughs> we are running a temple with our pal Indy. Mm-hmm. Like he might not be in the jeep with us, but we got to live up to that. And I think that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, At this point in 1995, the green laser beam would have activated an effect um, where what looked like rubble um, would fall from the ceiling. It was actually large chunks of ice that was like dyed brownish um, that would fall from the ceiling right next to you. And um, dirt ice, (laughs) dirt ice. And this um, this effect did not last for very long, maybe about a year. Um, It's it was an ice effect. There was water involved. Something happened. It's broken. It hasn't worked since. (laughs) This is the most infamous broken effect in that it did not last the opening year and people still talk about it like this is someday the ice will come back. But like, (laughs) let's let's consider this for a moment, folks. It was ice. It was ice. On, it a, was, on a ride. <laughs> and it was uh, extremely cool. And you can still hear the audio of the falling rubble um, right before you turn into the where the skeletons are. Yeah. Um, you can hear the audio of it, um, but it is no, it is part of the score, right? It's like built into the audio of the ride, but it, uh, it does no longer happen. But in 1995, that's what you would have seen. Just off to your left, this scary like pile of what looks like rocks falling from the sky. That's pretty um, cool, to be honest. Really cool. And from there, we face like the trials of Mara. Some of the things that have been um, alluded to in the queue, like the obelisk, are going to happen to us. That we've been warned about these like dangers that we are now going to face. And we enter a series of rooms, specialized rooms with specific fears inside them and the first one is skeletons go to room full of spooky skeletons <laughs> and very good very good a, a classic skeletons leap out at you uh-huh. uh, it is the chamber of the dead there's like a king painted in the background of a mural somewhere where it's like oh this is like an army of the dead actually this is, <laughs> this is really bad and some of them pop out at you um some of them no longer pop out at you but um but the skeletons, very scary. Yes. Um, one of them is wearing a Mickey Mouse hat. Oh, yeah. That's if true. you look very carefully. Um, the next room you go into, um, your it is a very, very dark room, and the Jeep headlights turn on, and you see that the wall is covered in bugs. No, Ew. not bugs. Gross. And you can hear them <laughs> skittering, and the, the lights on your Jeep will flicker. Uh, bringing them in and out of focus and um you know it's just the wall is just covered in bugs as it is the, clear in that moment that there are many bugs thousands and thousands and thousands of bugs um and then you cross a rope bridge um and you go you get even closer to uh the big giant statue of mara now the rope bridge itself in actuality is 50 feet above the above the ground that's wild that is wild. Um, so it's a 50 foot high rope bridge. And uh, in 1995, you would have experienced the sensation or the like you would have seen the visual of what looks to be like the rope bridge collapsing underneath you a little bit. Um, doesn't do that as much now. Um, but, you know, it would have felt more like the, the like the rope bridge was rickety and and was going to not like you might not make it in a Jeep <laughs> full right. of 12 people <laughs> across yeah, a rope it bridge. It seems odd to me that the rope bridge could survive any jeep let alone this jeep but okay go on fair enough fair enough um once you finish crossing this bridge and you look down and there's um a foggy you know you can't see the ground and it's just fog and what looks like lava or like magma bubbling up um underneath you um you cross the bridge you make a hard left turn through a room that is absolutely smothered in snakes snakes just so many you guys snakes. are on your own yep you hear indiana jones who classically is afraid of snakes everybody knows this about him he makes some some snarky comment about how uh, watch out for anything that slithers or tells you that you're on your own. One of one of those audios will play. And then there's this great big cobra that um, that in 1995 appears to lunge at you in a great loud hissing sound. And, oh, he's going to get you. But you dive right out of the way. 
he is no longer he is not currently working yes um, and the the cobra's fangs used to uh kind of drop down from the top of its mouth to make it look like it was now in attack mode um just to kind of emphasize that lunge uh not uh not a currently working effect not a currently working effect but um he's he's there he's chilling in uh in very still mode right now but he is <laughs> B, like B he's mode. he's like like twice as tall as the jeep and he's like lunging over top it's of you very scary snake. he's a huge yeah. snake um you go down a little hill um and you are now inside the giant skull of mara that was there and um and it is full of lit candles it's very spooky it definitely looks like the cultists have set up there that's like where their rituals take place yeah cuz it's like candles it's not it's not just like um like fire right yeah. it's actually like what appears to be like where the where like humans would have set up set up like a cult to mara yeah and in that in that space as you as you kind of dip through the skull there's a uh a giant matte painting thing that is done in like um uv paint it it, it glows under black light uh and it depicts a, a ghost a ghostly figure of mara kind of like menacing you uh and it, it goes and you're like ah <laughs> as, you, as you dive beneath it it's yes very cool. very cool and there's thousands of skulls also in, in this in this room uh in addition to the candles i forgot about all the skulls um i do believe that throughout the entire ride um not just in the in this part but throughout the entire ride there are more than two thousand replicated human skulls and a lot of them are in this room with the candles um but there are literally thousands of, of skulls scattered throughout the ride um and that's that's pretty intense that is pretty <laughs> um, intense um the next part of the ride um i for um completely forgot about or slash didn't um know about so uh buddy why don't you cover this uh next room <laughs> yeah yeah the next challenge of mara is rats <laughs> It's rats. It's rats. <laughs> uh, it, you know, the rat room has never really worked. Uh, even even in the heyday, it, it is a combination practical slash uh, uh, projected. projected effect that shows rats on a branch that uh, the jeep kind of plows through. Uh, the implication being that rats are falling into the jeep, and that's very icky. Uh, rats are such a non effect here. And Alice, you were telling me in our prep for this episode, you didn't even know it was rats. You I didn't it was, know like, it was spiders. I def so the rat effect is projected on like a sheet of fog, and it's supposed to look like a branch that's sticking over, and the rats falling off of it. And that yeah. effect has been in like such low definition, or like the fog has been so weak for as long as I can remember. Um, that I thought that the fog effect was supposed to be like cobwebs. I thought it was like like a sheet of cobwebs that you go through, yeah. and that the squeaking of the rats was just like ambiance. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, you know big tarantulas they squeak. I didn't realize <laughs> it was supposed to be rats until literally prepping for this episode. This is also a spot that the uh, the jeep tends to get stuck a lot. So you you spend a lot of time contemplating the rat effect and being and like, the, what and the, the what rat is sounds? This? <laughs> yeah, before what, you what turn before you turn the corner into the sheet of fog, you you're just kind of sometimes you'll stall right there um, in the dark. And it sounds like the Jeep is broken now. It does the thing that we talked about last episode where it sounds like the Jeep is just kind of like running through and the music hasn't kicked back up yet. Yeah. Um, and then you're turning a corner through a sheet of fog and you haven't really had a chance to, to investigate what it was. <laughs> what, are, what are the rats? <laughs> what is a rat? Um, and so that 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 room, um, yeah, that room hasn't been effective for, for many, 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 many years. But it might have been very effective on day one in 1995. Who is Maybe. to say? Apparently everybody else knew it was rats but me. <laughs> um, uh, and the next room may be the most famous, um, maybe the most famous effect in... Uh, in the whole ride, except I, maybe the boulder. Um, because I think the the room with the darts, um, where you drive through um, the room and it's a, a painted mural on either side and they're shooting like poison darts at you and you feel the puffs of air as the, as the darts narrowly miss you, yeah. right? Um, that effect and that like um i think they did that in a couple of the in a couple of the indiana jones movies yeah. um where you where indiana jones is running past a mural that is shooting at him 
Um, we can't have uh, an Indiana Jones ride where we don't get out of a dart hallway. Like, come on. Like, <laughs> yeah. this is this is an Indiana Jones ride. It's got to be darts. <laughs> right. Yes. And uh, like in, uh, I think in The Last Crusade, where he um, he like steps on a, he he has a, has like a pole and he, and he puts it on part of the floor and then the dart hits the pole. You are thinking him? of of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's but Raiders. I agree with you. Yeah. Okay, I couldn't remember. There's so many cool traps in those movies. <laughs> <laughs> they're all and they're all so fun. Yes. Um, so that that's like a really famous Indiana Jones moment. And I have learned in research for this episode that people don't like that room and that effect. They don't think it's as effective as it as it should be. Um, yeah, I think, I think there's I a little more going it. on in the in the <laughs> Tokyo edition. Um, it's just a little bit more convincing. Uh, we'll have to go into that in a in a future episode. Yeah, but I I, I I love that. I love the puffs of air that go past you. It always makes my hair fly around, and 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 the jeep feels like it's driving over like like really intense. I don't know cobblestones or maybe bones or something on the ground because yeah. the jeep is extra rickety in that room while you're yeah. like dodging darts. <laughs> uh, but but when we finally exit the dart room, we do approach the piece de resistance, the uh, the the final and most iconic moment. Uh, the thing that you know actually is in the first five minutes of Raiders of the Lost Ark that became synonymous with Indiana Jones. And that, Absolutely, of course, is the Boulder Room. The Boulder Room. This is the effect of the ride. Um, in 1995, and for many years after, um, the you would the Jeep would stall in place under under another audio animatronic of our friend Indiana Jones, and he is hanging from is it a rope or his whip? Um, he is hanging from the ceiling, and he is dangling over top of you. You are like under his feet, and he is telling you to back up, back up, back up, back up. Get out of here. <laughs> Get out of here. And he's he's shouting at you, and all of a sudden, there it is, the rolling boulder, which is 16 feet in diameter, a huge rolling boulder coming down the hallway at you. And this your thing Jeep, is incredible. Your Jeep make, feels like it's backing up, and it feels like it's backing up, and, it's, and it shudders in place, and then all of a sudden, the floor opens up underneath you, and you go down a ramp underneath the boulder, and the boulder rolls over your head, and then you've done it. You've made it out of the temple. <laughs> it, it opens us up into the scene as we escape the boulder of the boulder split in half and Indiana Jones standing next to it, like triumphantly in a pile of rubble. And he's like, next time I'll drive. Or like, <laughs> tourists, why'd why it have, it have to, to be, be tourists? tourists? <laughs> or he says like, now don't tell me that wasn't big fun. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, Indy, heck yeah, bro. Yeah. We got out of there. Yeah, he says something. Yeah, so it's uh, the boulder has run into like a like a low hanging archway um, and stopped still and cracked. And Indiana Jones is standing, wiping sweat off of his brow. There he is, the third Indiana Jones animatronic, um, looking very handsome, um, and and ushering you to the exit. And then you get off the jeep, and that's the end. That's yeah, the that's, whole. That's, that's the whole the story. Ride. That's the whole story of the ride. Now this ride tells. An incredible story inside of, you know, like four and a half minutes, maybe. Uh, not to mention over the course of an hour in the queue, uh, usually thereabouts. Um, and in 95, this was the attraction. Like, this was the next evolution. This was the e-ticket. And the thing that I keep hearing is as we talk about this ride more online and as we get more engagement around this series and as we as we start to kind of hear what people think of the ride is like this is the only real e-ticket left at disneyland <laughs> which okay like uh, your mileage may vary but i i don't think that's entirely true um no. but why do people say that like what is it about the way that it told the story in 95 the way that it continues to hold on to that legacy that makes us think like this is it. This is the ride. This is 
the one. This is the true E ticket. Maybe it's even an F ticket. Like it's beyond the E. Um, <laughs> well, that like, can't. I mean, it's patently untrue. We've got actual roller coasters in the <laughs> Disney parks that sure. have to qualify as E ticket. Any ride that's going to be fast paced enough that you like can't go on it if you have certain heart conditions is an E ticket. <laughs> is an E ticket ride automatically. I think. I think here in this context, people are using E ticket to mean of the highest quality, of pushing that. envelopes like sure. of high intensity. As sure. Well. Like, sure. They are also ignoring what e-ticket actually meant. <laughs> like like sure. an e-ticket an e would get you on to the biggest, fastest paced rides. Um, right. Those are the rides for the big kids. Yeah. Um, and that's because e-tickets were actually a thing. It's not just a turn of phrase. <laughs> uh, yeah. But fine, fine. If we're going to now we don't have e-tickets anymore. We're using them using the, the concept metaphorically. Yeah. Um, this ride is probably the scariest ride. Um, in the Disney parks, or in the, uh, at least the California Disney parks. Between the queue and the ride itself, it certainly reaches a level of uh, fear-inducing that uh, very little else tops. Uh, maybe for a while, Tower of Terror was up there. Um, but yeah. I, honestly, I, I feel like Temple of the Forbidden Eye has a beat. Um, it just feels more perilous. Yeah, the Tower of Terror has like a spooky, scary factor to it. That's like a oh, ghosts or something. Um, uh, like the Twilight like the, Zone or whatever, you know. Like or like the Haunted Mansion is kind of the same, right? Yeah. It's more of a like an eeriness than an actual like like terror. Um, Indiana Jones is terrifying if you are young enough or not ready for it. Um, yeah. There's like threats and actual like physical violence being done to, to humans in this ride, in in the queue and in the actual ride. You know, that makes it like scary and threatening in a way that other rides aren't. Yeah. Um. I, I think I think it's action packed and it's scary as heck. And I think that on top of it all are these layers and layers of storytelling. You know, the telegrams, the journals, the the boxes all over the queue with the different addresses on them, uh, the three newsreels, the the maroglyphics, and then on top of it all, when you finally get back onto the Jeep and experience this trip through the temple, you know, through the gates of doom, uh, the trail of torment and all of this. Uh, when you finally experience the trials of Mara and and triumphantly escape with your pal Indy, I mean like Name a more complete experience at the Disney parks. It's um, hmm, uh, uh, Rise of the Resistance, maybe. I think um, honestly, it's close. If, I, <laughs> if I'm being honest, Rise of the Resistance only barely, right, is is slightly more complete. Uh, the fact that there are live cast members that provide a lot of interactivity, the fact that there are several phases to the attraction. Um, you know, Indy can't really compete on those. Uh, the post-show of Rise of the Resistance, where the deboarding area is outside in Batu, and you're just like, oh man, we sure did crash land in our <laughs> escape pod, right? Like, <laughs> right. This, uh, is, this is providing a very complete package. Yes, and, and, I, and I don't... I don't want to I don't want to compare Indiana Jones to Rise of the Resistance. First of all, because there's nearly 30 years of development in between them um, where where effects technology has changed so, so, so much yes. um, there. They and to compare them feels like you have to choose a lesser one. And I can't. I like the rides both so much individually for different and same reasons that I <laughs> like like there's there's so much overlap and also so much different uh, like stuff between the two experiences that like to compare them feels um disingenuous almost i i think that um that the rise of the resistance is the uh, is the other experience in the disneyland parks right now that is um offering a a completely immersive um package like Indiana yeah. Jones is. I think um, Florida, I think uh, Flight of Passage does a pretty good job of making things feel story tied and um, and the, the the whole land surrounding it makes it feel very immersive and very, you know, that's a, that's a really excellent experience over there. I don't think it's the same. It's not as it's not as immersive, but it it does a really good job of like of pulling people in um, and making you feel like you're part of a story being told. 
Um, and it's very thrilling as well. Yeah. Um, there are, and, and other than that, other rides try bits and pieces of these elements, but none of them quite pull all of these, you know, things into one experience quite like Indiana Jones. Yeah. And I, I think that's what it is. It's the, it's the richness, right? It's the fact that it's got the cue elements as well as the practical effects, as well as the projection effects, as well as the enhanced motion vehicle. And it's got the story and it's got the adventure and it's got the menace and the danger. And in 95, nothing at the parks looks remotely like it. Uh, nothing at Disneyland, I should say, because it is one park at that point. Looks remotely like it. Your nearest analog, Alice, is Star Tours. Yeah. And and that's what I'm saying. is like in Star Tours, you get in the queue and you live in the world of Star Wars for a moment. And... You know, you see the big ship in the queue and you're ready and you get on the ship and you fly and you blow up the Death Star with your Power X and you escape and then you go back to Star Tours Terminal and that's it, right? But in Indiana Jones, you're on Indiana Jones long before you're on Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. You are living Indiana Jones in a way that Star Tours, because it's in the space formerly occupied by Adventures Through Inner Space can only dream of mm -hmm. Indiana Jones gets to go below the berm Indiana Jones gets to be haunted mansion but thrilling <laughs> Indiana Jones gets to put you in a pre-show that won't end to the point where people complain about how long it is I Indiana Jones is it is an hour's worth of experience if that's how long the queue is Indiana Jones is flexible Indiana Jones is uh, of a scale that, honestly, until we look at Rise of the Resistance, we're not topping at the Disneyland Resort. And that includes everything built at California Adventure, including the big old roller coaster back there, <laughs> formerly known as Scream and currently known as the Incredicoaster. I'm talking scale. A 16-foot boulder, 2,500 feet of linear cave to explore. You know, like, mm -hmm. nobody's doing it like Indy. And so, like, is it beyond an e-ticket? No, obviously. Like, we can't just invent uh, classifications, right? But is it the only e-ticket? Obviously not as well. Yes. But it is unique. It says, I am here. I am the biggest and the best. I am the thing that 1995 produced. And... I have ice that falls on my audience. You know, <laughs> I've got a rotating door system. I'm in introducing an element of random chance to a theme park ride, which feels innovative in 95. You know, it's it not, does. Not, not everybody is doing that at the time. Uh, and for me, you know, thinking back to when I was finally feeling brave and bold enough as a young person to get on Indiana Jones regularly, for me... Indiana Jones was also a place to kind of hang out. Like it was like it was like scary or whatever, but when we were old enough, Alice, when we were when we were teens, like we wiled away the hours in that temple. <laughs> uh there were there were nights we were there that we were some of the only guests and we would stop instead of continuing to walk towards the ride vehicles just to like hang out, look around. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't sit for for a long time, but we like lived there for a little yeah. while. We would, yeah, we would find the spot by the um, by the water fountain, and uh, it, which is kind of like set apart from the queue, so people could pass us in the queue, yeah. and we would just like refill our waters and sit and chat and like hang out and pull the rope or watch people pull the rope and laugh and and you know the yeah the the Indiana Jones queue became like like a cool place to be. We would hide behind parts of the cave, the guano covered cave, and like jump out and scare each other. One of, one of us would run further along and then hide and jump out. And, you know, we, we turned the whole ride into our, like, playground. Yeah. We turned I the remember... whole park into our playground. But <laughs> well, the ride... we, were, we were very unruly <laughs> teens. We were. <laughs> uh, I, I remember very clearly one time we were walking out the exit and a cast member had put themselves up into the bamboo pillars uh, up by the kind of, like, broken down wall part where you can kind of see Jungle Cruise. Uh, and like looked like they were dead 
and then like sprang <laughs> out at us. Uh, I was I was like terrified. I was like, what? <laughs> like Indiana Jones has this sense of play. Um, and you know, our next episode is called The Ride Today or Eternal Youth and Beauty. Uh, and that's because you know, the ride is still good. We spent a lot of time in this in this uh episode talking about how the ride opened with all of these innovative effects that are now removed or that never really worked, um, but that were really cool at the time, right? The ride still has that playful playfulness. It still has that that level of charm and detail and scale. We're gonna talk about next week how even though the ride is in many ways diminished from that glittering gold of its glory days, how the ride has evolved over time. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about my most recent experience on it. And it honestly, Alice might feel a little negative compared to some of this nostalgic talk. But I think what's important to note as we talk about 95 is that in 95, it had plenty of problems, too. I mean, like, the ice machine broke in, like, a week, Alice. <laughs> like, this was an ambitious project. It was unlike anything else at the parks. You've got to give it credit. But you've also got to say, like, guys, did we even think this through before we booted up these enhanced motion vehicles? Like, did we really think this through? <laughs> a rotating door platform, fellas? Like, come on. <laughs> we can't keep this sustainable. This isn't sustainable. And that's, yeah, that's the thing about this version of the ride that we all just walked through together um, is that um, very few of the effects, um, the, especially the, the big deal ones, uh, were sustainable for um, an extended amount of time. A lot of them were broken within the decade. Um, a lot, Several more of them broken just within the year. Um, <laughs> um, we, we don't have that version of the ride anymore and we might not ever see it again and that's the the discussion for next week but right but isn't it fun to look back on what on what we had and what um and the like spirit of it that continues today i agree well alice it sounds like our discussion of indiana jones and the temple of the forbidden eye as it opened in 1995 has come to an end but the conversation always continues online. Online is where you can find me and Alice most of the time. I am always on Twitter. You can find me at buddy underscore Duquesne. Duquesne is spelled D-U-Q-U-E-S-N-E. And I am on Twitter, Instagram, and on TikTok at Alice White THP for those happy places. And Alice, if people like what they hear and they've been listening along with this miniseries or our prior miniseries like, uh, you know, Theme Parks 100 or even Birds of Paradise from many, many moons ago, <laughs> um, and they want to support us monetarily because we're doing a pretty cool thing over here, what should they do? Well, the first thing they should do is go to patreon.com slash those happy places. That is a place to see how you can support the show monetarily. You can check out all of our cool um, perks uh, like bonus episodes and blog posts and even a chance to get maybe a sticker uh, <laughs> sent to you. Um, and once again, that website is patreon.com slash those happy places. Now, Alice, I'm going to add some music to this episode. And where would that music have come from, buddy? Well, the theme music for Eyes of Mara is called There Will Come a Time. It's by Halizna CC0, uh, a artist that I found on the Free Music Archive. Find details about them and their copyright information, which is a Creative Commons uh, Zero license, which is pretty cool. It, it means it's a public domain, actually. Uh, All right. On the show notes. And I'm also going to include some music from Kevin McLeod. Kevin's website is incompetech.com. Uh, and all of the licensing information about that, Creative Commons 4.0 attribution, can be found in the show notes as well. But I'm hearing a familiar tune kind of ramping up in the background. Oh, is that 
Hang on, that sounds like Golden Gate by the California Feet Warmers featuring Phil Alvin. Oh, it sure is. I love that song. You can find this song and many other tracks by the Feet Warmers on their website, CaliforniaFeetWarmers.com. Thank you so much to the Feet Warmers for letting us use this amazing track. And thank you, Alice, for doing this mini-series with me and for doing this episode with me. I had a really good time remembering our uh, just absolutely chaotic teen years uh, <laughs> on uh, on and around Indiana Jones. We used to have a whole script that we would play out uh, mm-hmm. where we would tell each other not to panic and name ourselves <laughs> the leader of the expedition. And sure. We would f- really annoying. <laughs> we could fight over who gets to drive and then, yeah, tell everybody. Uh, yell, yell at whoever has the steering wheel that they're doing a bad job yep 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 yeah we were pretty we were pretty messy back in the <laughs> back in the early 2000s we were rowdy we were for teens. sure um but we surely have so many good memories of this and i'm so glad that i get to go over these memories with you every week of this show and uh it's just like a dream come true to talk talk about all of this with you thank you for being my best friend and to everyone i say next time you wear blindfolds all right <laughs> <laughs>